So now we have to forget the sunshine here and the heat and the beautiful hall and because we are now moving out to the North Sea outside Norway, 1969. And it's an autumn day and it's cold and awful. And we are going on board the drilling platform called Ocean Viking. Now the people there are quite, uh, you know, fed up. They've been drilling for a long time. They are looking forward to Christmas and they are drilling the last well. Then two o'clock in the morning, this guy called Ståle Salvesen is asked to wake up the platform chief. And he's just like, hey, you have to wake up. Wow, uh, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning. You need a really good reason to wake me up. And GDD had a good reason. They had just struck oil, Ecofisk, the biggest offshore oil find in the world. Now, I have called this lecture uh, Defining Moments. And of course, finding oil in Norway was one of these defining moments. But we have a lot of these defining moments over time. You know, Neil Armstrong on the moon, Steve Jobs with his first phone, 9-11, and so on. But not all defining moments need to be, you know, world events. They can be uh, smaller things, they can be personal things. Some of them are expected and some of them are unexpected, you know, it can be the birth of your child, it can be the death of somebody. It's basically the beginning of something and it's the end of um, something else. Um, now, how can you best prepare for these kind of defining moments? Is there something you can do? Well, I think there are some um, human characters that can help us prepare for these kind of things. And I think they start with grit, I think they include patience. They would also include what you in Swedish called uh, uh, dunning, uh, or building, and they would include what I call confident humility. So let's start with, with grit. Now, what is, what is grit, really? Well, I am um, in the army, spent time in what was then called the Tolkskolan, this kind of the Russian language course. And I'll tell you, it's basically hell on earth. At least that's what I think. <laughs> you spend the whole time learning Russian. Now, how many people here speak Russian? Yeah, so there is a reason why there are not more of you, because it's very difficult. Uh, and I had just been spending a lot of time trying to learn Russian, and uh, I thought it was just uh, too complicated, and I was just about to throw in the towel. So I put on my coat, went to the, uh, to the kind of the head of the, that army division, and was just about to knock the door to tell him that I was quitting. And I just couldn't quite get me to do it. And I was standing outside for five minutes without knocking that door. And that's probably the best thing I have never done. Um, and I just hung in there for the rest of the period, you know, with my nails, managed to scrape through as a second worst student in class, and managed to make my best friends ever. Now, what did, what did I learn from that? Well, you know, we all, we all love this idea of talent. And that means, you know, natural aptitude. But I don't really believe in that kind of stuff. I believe in grit, because grit prepares you for these moments much more than talent. Now, grit is about follow through, it's about re resilience, it's about perseverance, it's about not giving up, and it is the powerful motivation to achieve an objective. Basically, it is take it on the chin, don't give up, and move on. Now, for those of you who are students, it is important to understand that grit and the ability to hang in there can compensate for not so fantastic grades. And for those of you who are employers, I can kind of see that we've split in behalf of you have, you know, we have the past generation and the future generation, you know. <laughs> um, but for those of you who are employers, it's also important to understand that, you know, it's not about grades, it's about grit. We're going to make a small um, experiment, so if you can all can raise up here a tiny second. 
and then I'm going to count four, three, two, one, and then I'm going to say jump. And when I say jump, I just wanted to make a small jump. So four, three, two, one, jump. Beautiful, beautiful. So now you can sit down. <laughs> so, so, what was that? so what was that about? Okay, this week we launched a podcast series at the Oil Fund. And next week, we'll release the episode with the chief executive of Goldman Sachs, David Salomon. Now, I interviewed David Salomon. And I asked him, hey, what's the difference between young people before and now? And he said, Nikolai, you know what? When I was young, people asked me to jump. I just jumped. These days, you ask the young people to jump, and it's just like, jump? Me? No, first of all, why should I jump? How high should I jump? Is it safe to jump? Can I jump tomorrow? All these kind of things. Nike had the slogan, you know, just do it. And that's a bit like it is. It's related to grit. It is just sometimes just do it. Sometimes you just have to jump. OK. I also believe in patience and long-term learning. And they are very, very important parts of my life. The ability to learn throughout your life has never been better. And we are here indeed today in a center for education, for uh, uh, you know, continued education. Really, really wonderful. Um, yet, young people get really stressed about their education, you know, in their early 20s. And, and why is that? You know, wh why is it that uh, you guys who have the whole life in front of you are in such a hurry? And then those of us who are nearly dead, who have uh, not so many years left, we have all the patience in the world. It just doesn't make any sense. Because it's not by the age of 25 that you should judge your life, it's when you're 80 you should look back and have a look at it. And I think perhaps it has to do with the understanding of time. My predecessor, he took German philosophy books with him to a little island in northern, northern Norway and spent six months in a little hut reading German philosophy. And I think what we should all do is to travel together to Bhutan, park ourselves at some kind of monastery at the top of the mountain top and drink green tea with the Buddhist monks for five years. That's when you understand what time is about. Now, the Swedish word build, building uh, doesn't really have a good English translation, but I think you probably know what it is. It's about what kind of knowledge and skills you should obtain in life to become a good citizen. The more you know about the world and the history, the better and more interesting person you would, be, you would be. So my advice to all you young guys, read widely, even though it's not on the curriculum, even though you're not going to be asked about it in your future exam. Read history and fiction, you know, see art exhibitions, go to the theater, listen to classical music. Be curious about more in life than what is on your professor's reading list. And then, key, travel. Travel as much as you can. Never save any money. When you get your student loan, make sure you blow the whole thing. It's the best investment you can ever make. And it's also the most fun. OK. None of us here today are geniuses. And the sooner we realize that, the better it is. Because it's only when we start to look around us and see what other people can offer in terms of opinions and advice and so on, that's when uh, uh, things will start to move in the right direction. And we have to learn from other people. So um, my first job uh, after uh, university was in the city of London. Now, I went to one of these American business schools, and if there is one thing they are very good at there, you know what that is? It's to inflate your ego. Okay? 
they massively inflated my ego at this uh, school. And I started my first job, uh, like you will do, many of you, and I kind of thought I was God's gift to finance. Um, so after six months, uh, my, my, uh, my, uh, my boss said, Nicola, you know, it's uh, now the day before uh, your Christmas holiday. We need to have a bit of a debrief, okay? Uh, so we went out the door, uh, went down to this wine bar. You know, you go down these stairs, and it's, you go down there, and it's quite dark. And, you know, we, we had a pint each. And then he pulled out a list which was longer than a roll of toilet paper with all my mistakes. It was horrifying. You know, this was the day before my Christmas holiday. I didn't sleep for four days, and I just felt like I was a complete disaster. And then I just realized, you know what? He's got a point. I've been just, I've been so bad. I really need to get my act together. And that's kind of what I did. And I decided, you know, I'm going to show them. And that's what I've been trying to do ever since. Okay, and I, I, I like really feeling inferior, knowing that I know very little. That's a driving force in my life. Now, the American psycho um, social psychologist Adam Grant, he talks about this concept called confident humility, okay? So you need to trust yourself and have faith in yourself, because if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to believe in you. At the same time, too much confidence in yourself is uh, dangerous and will lead you in the wrong direction. And that is probably one of the most important things I have learned as an investor. It's you have to be stubborn and take risks, but when the facts change, you have to change your mind. And quite a lot of people just fall in love with their own opinions and their own views, and that is very, very dangerous and is very expensive. So how do you learn from your own mistakes? Okay, so in the oil fund, we, ha we are doing this really cool thing. We, are, we have hundreds of millions of data points, consisting of all the trades we have ever done, you know, everything, everything everybody has ever done, and we're putting this into a system. So let's say now, Veve wants to buy shares in Kony, okay? Uh, so she is going to enter the, uh, the order, and then he's just like, uh, but Veve, you have never made money in, in a, an industrial company before. Uh, you certainly have never made money in Finland. Uh, everybody loves Kona. Uh, by the way, you're quite stressed because you now lost money nine months in a row. And historically, when you have done that and you try to trade, that has been really, really bad. And the reason you have been down for this trade is because of a company meeting, and you are really crap in company meetings, and so this has normally been a bad excuse for you. So it just feeds back all this information to you. Unbelievably powerful. Nobody likes to see their own mistakes, but this mistake machine is just putting all into a system, and it's combining you know, social psychology, uh, uh, finance, behavioral uh, finance, and all these kind of things in a completely new way. So we are revolutionizing that. And it's basically putting, mis putting mistakes into a system. Now, it's not only the personal features that prepare us for defining moments. Because most of the time we interact with, with other people. Now, there is a quote saying that none of us is as smart as all of us. And that's by an author called Kenneth Blanchard. And he's kind of pretty explanatory, self-explanatory. And rarely are great results achieved by one person alone. These days, Nobel Prizes are normally won by teams not individuals. When people come together, they need to be organized. And, of course, one way of organizing these things is bureaucracy. Now, there is nothing wrong with bureaucracy as such, but the bureaucratic model of organizing people, in my mind, uh, it's, uh, well, I should put it mildly, since I work in a bureaucracy, it's not my favorite. Now, the book Humanocracy uh, by Gary Hamill point to bureaucracy and say that we should not resign ourselves to organizations that are less capable than the people in them. So not resign ourselves to an organization which is less able than the people in them. And that is what bureaucratic models do. They make humans less than what they are. And that's why I don't like them. 
So to solve the challenge, the first thing we need to do is what is called silo busting. A silo is something that divides things from each other. It creates walls, fences, and boundaries. They may look good on paper, but they really hamper an organization. And in the oil fund, we work really hard to tear them down. And so therefore, the mistake machine I told you about, these are really people coming together from various parts of the organization, working together. Here we have high-tech experts, we have traders, portfolio managers, all these type of people working together. Before, they worked in silos. Now, we have best of them. I like the idea of what is called humanocracies instead of bureaucracies. And what is that? Well, in a bureaucracy, strategy is set at top. In humanocracy, it's an open, firm, wide discussion. In bureaucracy, innovation is a specialized activity. In humanocracy, it's everybody's job. In bureaucracy, control comes from oversight and rules. In humanocracy, control comes from transparency and peers. Another important dimension in getting people to work together is to put the right people together. That is what we call diversity. In the oil fund, you have traditionally found people with economics background. Now, that's about to change. Now we have political scientists working with communications. We, for instance, have one here. We have philosophers working with corporate governance. We have uh, a doctor as a portfolio manager. We, have, we work with sports psychologists uh, to work with a whole team, and so on. We have uh, cybersecurity experts with no formal education whatsoever. You know, they are like diehard hackers. Really, really good. And of course, an organization needs people with a, dof, a lot of different skill sets and backgrounds and life experience. And that's, it's when they start to disagree and you get this friction, that's when stuff starts to happen. And that makes us better prepared for these defining moments. Now, let me ask, me, ask you, you know, who do you hire to your company? Someone completely different from yourself? Or somebody who is pretty much the same? Because if you look at CEOs of Norwegian and Swedish companies, it's a rather homogeneous group, and I suspect the same is true in Finland. People have been to the same universities, they read the same books, they are friends, they attend the same lectures, they all listen to the same professors. Most have studied business, and in Norway, despite most of the companies there being knowledge-based companies, only three of the top 50 companies have a CEO with a background in HR. Three out of 50. HR. Not good. Now, it's much easier to hire somebody who is the same as you, uh, because there is so much less risk involved. You know, in the old days, we said nobody gets sacked for uh, buying IBM. And it's a bit like that, uh, you know, when hiring. No, I don't believe in that. I believe that diversity needs to be really uh, an integral part of what we do. It needs to be an integral part of the DNA of the company. It's not something you can delegate to the HR department. And a trend we are seeing now internationally is that you have now people responsible for diversity. Diversity officer. Uh, diversity director. Chief diversity officer. FBI has got one. They got one at Harvard Business School. I, uh, probably uh, some of your companies have got one. Uh, and this has really exploded over the last few years. But the thing is that diversity can't be delegated. And I feel it's a bit like love, you know? You have to take care of it yourself. You cannot delegate it to HR. That's how important it is. Behind a lot of these defining moments, there has been a strong leader. At least that's what the history tells us. In a perfect world, you don't need leaders because people can take care of itself, can take care of themselves. Well, of course, the world isn't quite perfect, so, uh, so we kind of need leaders to get the best out of people. Now, first of all, if you are a leader, stay out of the way as much as you can. Know when you are needed. Because the people who work for you know it better than you do. 
Your job as a leader is to, to make the environment as good as possible for these people so that they can perform, stay motivated, and be inspired and be on target. So what you need to do then is to communicate, 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 and ask for feedback. In the oil fund, we try to do this all the time and share as much as we can. And what is the most read thing that we publish on the internet? There is one thing that is just more popular than anything else. That is the notes from the leader group meetings, because we also publish those. I mean, not always the absolute full details, but everybody knows what we discuss in leader, leader group meetings. Very, very powerful. Then they know what's coming over the next three to six months, and they are never taken completely by surprise. Then, of course, LinkedIn, great thing. Now, how many people here follow me on LinkedIn? Uh, what's, what's wrong with the rest of you? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's not very good. <laughs> um, and to improve communication even more, we have now launched the Oil Fund podcast. Now, why did we do that? Well, the thing is that, who owns the oil fund? Norwegian people. The Norwegian people should see what they own, they should understand the companies in which we are invested. Also, there is nobody else in Norway who has got access to, the, to all these unbelievable CEOs. And so I interviewed the CEOs of these great companies. This week, BP, next week, Goldman Sachs, the week after, General Motors, and so we are going to continue on. And guess who I'm going to interview on Monday? Ah, Henrik Anrols from Kone. Yes. Very good. And so this podcast is all about transparency and openness. And um, we think it can be uh, really, really important. I encourage you to uh, zoom in as well. Now, then feedback, very important. When I started in the oil fund, I interviewed 140 people. I uh, had like, conversations lasting between half an hour and one hour with 140 people in the fund. There was one conversation I really remember. The head of bond trading. Now, what does a bond trader do all day long? Well, he listened to central bank speech. We even have an ex-head uh, of central bank here, I think. So uh, these bond traders, they listen to people like you. Now, I had just had uh, a press conference, which uh, didn't go uh, fantastic, I would say. Uh, so I sat in a meeting, and he says, uh, Nikolai, I just, you, you seem to be a person pretty keen on feedback. Yeah, I said, that's great. I just have to tell you one thing that press conference, you were really crap. Uh, you know, you just stank. The whole thing was terrible. So, oh, wow, well, that's, uh, that's good. That's, uh, that's what we call a straight puck. I like it. Uh, so what did I do the next time? Well, he helped me prepare for the next press conference. You know, you have the bond trader helping you to prepare for the next press conference. So take criticism uh, in a very positive way. I love this guy, you know. He has uh, promotions ahead of him. <laughs> so communication, feedback, and credit is the most important when it comes to this intrinsic motivation. Now, we split motivation into extrinsic motivation. That's like salary and stuff. So you young people, don't focus in on too much on that. What is important is the intrinsic motivation. You know, what is your reason for hanging into your job when things are really tough. That's uh, very, very important. Now, by the way, in this podcast with uh, the Goldman Sachs CEO, what does he say? Is that he says, and you will listen next week, if you are happy two-thirds of the time, that's pretty good. So you should be able to be kind of slightly miserable one-third of your time. Still okay. Hang in there. Um, now, so this intrinsic motivation is uh, really, really, really important, and that's the kind of thing that you need to trigger when you are a CEO. So you need to be very, very generous with, with, uh, with the credit you get. I kind of believe that if you don't care who gets the credit, there is no limit for what you can achieve. Very important. Now, let's connect the dots. Can you think of a defining moment in your life? 
Now, I have multiple, and I've shared some of them uh, with you today. Uh, some of these defining moments you are prepared for, some of them not. And I believe that some of these personal features, such as grit, uh, patience, um, confident humility, and building are important features to make you come through them in the best possible way. And I also think that the way we organize ourselves is very, very important from that point of view. Believe in humanocracies, not bureaucracies. I think diversity will help us and make the most out of it. And I really believe that communication, feedback, and credit really contribute to people's ability to grow. But if we take a few seconds and think a bit more about the defining moments, I mean, it could be anything, something major in the history uh, of the world that affected you or something personal. Well, 24th of February this year was a defining moment with Russia invaded Ukraine. And the world as we know it was, was turned completely upside down. And we are now witnessing a fully-fledged war in Europe. And I have often been asked, what is, uh, what's the big dangers and what is the threat to the oil fund? And I always said, you know, it's geopolitics and it's inflation. But little did I know that we would have a fully-fledged war in Europe for the first time since the Second World War. And it forces me to rethink a lot of the, the things that I had thought about before. Uh, we, we conducted a, a leadership seminar in the oil fund last week with all the leaders in the fund. We were 150 people together. And I asked them to think how this uncertainty was impacting what we were doing and how we should approach life. Now, I asked them to really care for the people that they are leading. You know, really, really care. Connect with their colleagues at a deeper level. And I think that in the uncertain times that we are facing now, that is just more important than ever. We need more glue between the people, and we need more love. So maybe I will add that to the features of what I believe is important to best prepare for defining moments. The ability to care, you know, really, really care deep down. Thank you so much. So, Nicola, you want to be part of the new generation or the past? I'm the youth. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> but so are you. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much for that inspiring, energizing, energizing lecture and address uh, highlighting so important issues, uh, such as continuous learning, patience, the drive for future, creativity, and so forth. There are multiple issues that we obviously would like to ask you and and discuss about, um, specifically some issues about the oil fund and maybe about the capital markets mm. going forward. But obviously, obviously, we have to start with the devastating, devastating uh, historical brutality which is taking place as we are here today. Um, 30 days ago, the world witnessed something, as you correctly pointed out, we haven't seen at the European continent since the Second World War. How worried exactly should we be? No, I think we should be, uh, I think we should be very worried uh, for many different reasons. Um, I mean, one thing is, uh, you know, the human tragedy and the attitude towards people and lives, which we haven't kind of seen since medieval age. Uh, and it's kind of bringing it back to kind of the Cold War and, and even worse than that, I feel. And I kind of thought the world had moved on a bit. It clearly hasn't. Um, so that's the tragedy on Ukraine isolated. But what is happening now also with food uh, supply, uh, food inflation and so on, that's hitting the poor people, uh, you know, across the world. And um, the problem with these crises is that they normally hit the less fortunate people in society. We saw it in the financial crisis. We've seen it now in COVID. You know, it hits the poorest geographies and the poorest people in societies. Uh, the climate crisis is going to be even worse because the places where you can hardly grow food, uh, they are the areas where uh, there is going to be no food, uh, you know, fastest. 
And this is just one more example of how this crisis hit uh, so unfairly in society. You highlighted the uh, value of a uh, wide learning, not only specifically on a specific curriculum, but uh, expanding even on your own initiatives to classics, arts, humanities, and so forth. You are a good example of that when it comes down to your background as an education. Um, we know from your CV that you served with the Norwegian intelligence, and you made your thesis about the Russian rhetorics <laughs> during the regime of Michael Gorbachev. Yeah. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been hearing uh, some media reports about a private discussion which uh, our president uh, Ninista had with Vladimir Putin. Ninista saying that Putin was emphasizing that terrible things will be happening. Terrible things will be happening if NATO escalates these things. Similarly, the spokesperson to Kremlin in the interview to CNN is saying that in case there would be an existential crisis, Russia will not shy away of using nuclear weaponry. Now, your personal view about the Russian rhetorics, we are using terminologies such as nuclear weapons, terrible things, existential threat. How does that translate to you? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't translate very well, I have to say. Um, now, the problem I have in my job is I'm not allowed to uh, say anything political, right? So I, uh, I, when I uh, joined the oil fund, I said that I thought the inheritance tax should be 100%. <laughs> and I kind of believe in that, you know? Everybody should start from square one, uh, and so on. And I, had, I got into big trouble. So since then, I've been a bit more careful with political statements. Uh, <laughs> Now, um, but your question, um, but, I, but I, if I can take the other part of your question in a way, the, um, you know, why you want to have uh, a varied background and why you want to have, uh, why you want to read up on different types of uh, thoughts and so on. And I think there are many reasons for that. One, I think it just makes you a more interesting person. It's more fun to talk to people who know a lot about different things. You know, you're just more interesting to sit around at a dinner table. You, you speak with different, in a, in, you speak with people in a different way. You understand, uh, you know, what they talk about. You understand the language, the jingo. You interface better with more people in the organisation because you understand what they are concerned about, uh, and so on. I think most of the creativity in society comes from uh, putting together existing ideas in a different way and in a new way. I do see most of the, the really cool stuff that we are doing in the oil fund now is a combination of. Uh, theories that were not put together before, like social psychology and finance and so on, and to the young people here, you know, you just need to go and study social psychology. Everything interesting in the world is in that field. So, um, so I think that's just key, you know? It's and then, um, for people when we, get, when we get older and we stop working and so on, in particular men have a lot of their self-confidence and self-worth, tied up in the job title, and when that disappears, we become really miserable. So if you have some other interests, I'm not sure that's never going to happen to you, but, uh, you know, if you have some other interests, it just makes life more fun. And when you have problems at work, if work is everything you have in life, then you are going to have a tough time. If you have some other interests on the side, it's just going to make the setbacks easier to, uh, to cope with. So a lot of reasons for that. For sure. I hope that we will get to the fun part, but I can't, uh, I can't miss the opportunity of asking a few follow-up questions about the economical situation. The, the, uh, the, the world, world's economical system has been bombarded with uh, several crises. Now we are for the third year in the middle of a pandemia. Now we have this devastation of the war. Um, the economy has been pretty resilient in order to batter, the, the, to mitigate the consequences so far. Yeah. Are we now at the stage where we are running out of the toolkits? Yeah, I think we probably are. Um, and um, um, one more consequence of what's happening now in, in Ukraine is that inflation, which was already pretty rampant, is now really accelerating again. And, uh, uh, my impression is that uh, the central banks are, are continue to be behind the curve, and um, uh, it will lead to rates uh, having to go up uh, quite significantly, which is of course negative both for 
bond portfolios and for equity portfolios. So it's bad for pretty much all of capital markets. And the problem is that when you have the type of situation you have now, um, where you have a lot of supply side uh, issues, when you increase interest rates, it doesn't impact the supply side, it impacts the demand side. So there is a very real possibility that you can, can get into a, a stagflationary period. Now, stagflation is the combination of inflation and low economic growth, and it's toxic. It's the worst thing you can have. Now, we publish uh, uh, these type of stress tests on the oil fund, and it means that we think the fund can go down 40% in such a scenario. And that's what you don't want to have. 40%? Uh, 40%. Now, where do you hide? There's nowhere to hide. Nowhere to hide. You can go into a period of 10 years where you don't make money anywhere. How would you compare this to the reminiscent of the 1970s when the stagflation was kicking in? So that's exactly where we can go back. That's the scenario we can see again. And uh, now, this is a, obviously, from the fund's perspective, this needs to be a defining moment, that the defining moments is important from the strategic perspective to know what you should do, but also not what to do. How do you see the investment decisions going forward? Well, um, the fund is so big that there isn't, you know, there aren't so many places to hide, right? So, so that's the first thing. And also, the way we run money is really well anchored with the with the government. And one of the one of the successes of, you know, I have to say. Um, uh, you know, I should be a bit careful here because we have uh, the Norwegian ambassador to, to Helsinki and we have the Finnish ambassador to Oslo both sitting here. So and I'm sure they're going to report back to, to Norway, but I'll say it anyway. Um, you know, one of the really fantastic things with, uh, with Finland is your industrial base and is how you, how you are really patient and how you build industrial activity, you know, over the long term. And, uh, and the internationalization you've had and the, you know, the quality of what you do. Really, really impressive. You think that if you can compound a 10%, that's really great, and of course that's fantastic. In Norway, we are more used to you know, very cyclical industries. We think that when we had a lot of herring coming into the fjord, we kind of closed off the fjord, had a lot of herring, spent a lot of money, and then we were poor again pretty quickly after. Uh, so we have never been particularly long-term thinkers in Norway. I mean, Doug, that's correct, right? I mean, you're the ambassador, you can confirm. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of surprising that we actually managed to make this oil fund, you know, to really save for future generations. You know, we started it 25 years ago. We deposited two billion Norwegian krona uh, into the fund. Now we are like 11,000 billion. It's unbelievable. You know, it's uh, two million kroner per household. We own 1.5% of all the companies in, in the world, 26 of all the listed companies in Europe. It's just, it's just incredible, right? Uh, but here there was like politicians and the public sector coming together, making a lot of the right choices and being consistent on it. Uh, and then of course we've had a bit of luck as well. But, uh, but you know, it's just like, it's a fairy tale story. Does the Unbelievable. Does the fund today hold any particular views when it comes down to Russian equities? Well, we had, um, we had uh, 27 billion Norwegian kroner invested in Russia at the beginning of the year. Now that's uh, pretty close to zero. Was that a business decision or was that a political decision? Yeah, good question. So, uh, so it's pretty close to zero without us having done anything yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, 27 billion kroner is a lot of money, but it is 0.2% of the oil fund, so we, 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 can, we can survive it. But um, uh, our investment decision had been to kind of sit through this, but then the political decision came that we should out of Russia. Mm. Now, the problem is, how do you get out of Russia today without breaching the, uh, you know, the, the rules? Uh, because we cannot sell to the oligarchs. And how do you make sure that you don't sell to the oligarchs? Exactly. Because I can sell to you, but I don't know, you know, uh, you, know you may sell to Christoph uh, afterwards without me knowing it. So We can talk about that. Yeah, exactly. So there we go. Um, so that's what we're going to try to avoid. So we'll see how we can uh, disentangle ourselves from, yeah. from Russia. Yeah, exactly. How to prevent the oligarchs buying with a significant discount is yeah. from the technically speaking rather challenging yeah. task. Now, 
few things about corporate social responsibility, ESG, transparency. You've been, and the fund's been very promotive of that notion as a, as a fundamental key criteria to your, your investment decisions. Now, some cynics are claiming that during these times of trouble, the relative importance and focus of ESG would be, as a function of time in an interim, diminishing rather than increasing. You don't surely share that view, do you? Well, I, th I, think it's an, um, I think it's a very interesting question. I think we'll see. You know, there's been a lot of focus on ESG amongst everybody uh, over the last few years now. That's kind of, is that a nice to have when you already let, made a lot of money? So it's just like something you put on top. And, and perhaps I thought uh, that way until a couple of years ago. But I do think the world has changed. And um, when you read interviews with, ast <coughs> with astronauts, what you see, that astronauts who have been out in space, when they come back, they are concerned about the world in a different way than they were before they, before they went up. They have seen you know, the world as one little thing, and they have seen how interconnected the world is. And I think the pandemic, in a way, has had the same function. You know, gee, I mean, the distance between Beijing and you know, Italy was not very long. And so, you know, that connectivity, I think it's just much clearer to us. You know, you, don't, you can't pollute in China without that having any com consequences for us. So I think, and I think it's really sunk in amongst chief executives and amongst board members. It's comp people have really taken in the seriousness of this in a different way than they had before. How big of a role does a leadership play? In a lot, a lot. But not, only, uh, but not only leadership, because I just don't think you have any choice. Because if you're a company now and you, and, you, and you are not a, let's say now you're not a sustainable company. Well, first of all, you're not going to get any loan from the bank. Mm. The insurance company is not going to want to insure you. You're certainly not going to have any people working for you and you have no clients. They just don't want to buy what you produce. So I don't think you have any choice anymore. The... Uh more or less the universal notion and the ambition to decarbonize the economy, going towards the zero emissions <coughs> target, and the fund's relative position in oil and gas industry, still per today. Uh, is there a controversy? <coughs> uh, whether we still can buy oil and gas companies. Um, so in, when you look at the portfolio and how you uh, construct it, you, you, have, you basically have a choice between two things. You can solve the problems by, um, by selling out all the problems. And I kind of think that's a bit like just leaving home when you have a marriage problem, you know, like straight away. <laughs> what we are doing uh, is to own these companies and have dialogue and conversations with management and try to move them in the right direction. That's what we do as an oil fund, and I really think that's the way forward. Because if you don't sell, you don't know who's going to end up with these companies. You, you know, it could be uh, really irresponsible investors who would own these companies, putting no pressure on the management, and so then you don't really solve anything. Right, so the long-term ownership will play to the benefit of pursuing so. those, uh, those ambitions while going forward. Yeah, and we do that all the time. We have, last year we had close to 3,000 conversations with, uh, with companies. And from the governor's perspective, how does that play out? Because obviously there is an independent board and there is a management team. How does the owner influence in the actual decision-making of the company in order to pursue in a meaningful fashion those targets? Yeah, so all the, ma all the main expectations we have to our companies uh, is uh, anchored in the government. We have eight uh, so-called expectations documents where we lay out uh, what, how we expect companies to behave. So, uh, uh, and that's reflected in how we vote at AGMs, so annual meetings, which uh, all companies have once a year. So we attend 12,000 company meetings a year uh, with all of these AGMs. We vote at 120,000 proposals. So a really, really big uh, kind of voting machine we have. <clears throat> For the first time now, we announce our voting intentions five days ahead of time so that everybody can see how we vote. And that can be controversial. Today, we announced how we are going to vote at the Ericsson AGM next week. And it made the front page of Dagens Industrie, because we are not going to support the, the, the board uh, in some of their actions. 
and what is called uh, you know, the discharge of board responsibilities. So we are not going to support it. Now then all the other shareholders can look at that and, and have a closer think about what they think. So transparency. Absolutely, 100% transparency. So we are, we are the most transparent fund in the world. Everybody can look at what we own, what we vote, how we behave, everything. Okay, now uh, finally, hopefully to the more fun issues, oh, not to mention ESG is of course fun. Absolutely. But uh, uh, for our student audiences, your lecture identified some key learnings you were identifying the issue of grit and patience, endurance. Um, do you think that for the benefit of developing academic curriculum, they should somehow reflect that ambition, that they should be expanded beyond just to focusing on a, a particular topics? In, in some, something which was <coughs> traditionally in the British university system probably mm. embedded. Yeah, no, it was embedded in the British system and it is embedded in the, in the US system to a higher degree than what we have seen in the Nordic region. Now, I'm a really, uh, I'm a really great believer in it. Uh, the thing is that you have to do it yourself with how you spend your time and what you read and, and what you study. But I think it's, uh, I think it's really worth doing and um, you know, have a lot of extracurricular activities. The problem is that these guys just look at your grades and you want to do a lot of other things and it's difficult to prioritize your time, right? So I think it needs to be from both sides. We who hire, we need to have a more holistic view on what we look for. Uh, and then the young generation would need to uh, broaden out. It was very interesting when you said that uh that it's not only on recruitment, it's not only an HR challenge, but it should be a challenge for the, exa for the entire executive team on an everyday basis. Mm. Making sure that there is diversity and <clears throat> there is a long for creativity and uh, continuous learning and questioning the self-evident. Well, you know, increasingly I look at leadership as a three-dimensional box and uh, you know, the, the length is kind of the length and undivided attention you give your colleagues. So when they come into your office, it's like, you know, look up from your screen, turn off your phone, you know, give them undivided attention. That's the one thing. The second thing is the diversity and the range of people you engage with. I think that's important. And then I think more important than ever is the depth, you know. How do you engage with your, with your people? At what level? What do you talk about and what do you care about? And it's more important than before, one, because the world is in flux, secondly, because there is more remote working. Uh, you know, a lot of us work from home a couple of days a week, there's just less glue, and therefore you need to connect at a different level. And you have another, you know, a lot of things in society, people are more lonely than before. You know, the last three years I've seen statistics uh, pointing to people being roughly 10% more lonely than they were, you know, recently. So all these things work together. So I think we just need to look at uh, this connectivity between people in a different way. You, you mentioned the, the, the concept that it's very important to believe in yourself, to have a self-confidence, but at the same time to have a certain, certain element of humility to it. How would you steer the future generation going forward in, in, in balancing that fairly, fairly difficult, at least conceptually fairly difficult question setting? Well, it's, it's, it's tough to find the balance, right? Um... Yeah, definitely, you have, to, you have to believe in yourself. But it is that kind of con continuous questioning of whether things are right or wrong. It's not to be too kind of sucked into the echo chamber of your social media, uh, you know, vacuum. Um, it's to uh, talk to people who are different than yourself. It's to ask for feedback and put that into a system. I think there are many ways of doing it, but it's, not, it's not easy. Intelligence, maybe? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. But it's not, uh, it's, not, it's not an easy mindset to get into, yeah. but I think it's very important. Right. Yeah. Well, I can confirm that, uh, as you said, in, in, in terms of a Norwegian and, uh, and a Swedish culture, is that indeed the CEOs of the Finnish companies tend to come from the same yeah. Same uh, schools, they are, they are sharing the same alumni. Most of them even look alike. Now, well, uh, they, they look alike and they, uh, they go to the same shoots yeah, all the time as well. Right, right. How do you <laughs> I, make I, sure... I to some of them, they're fun. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how do you make sure that the diversity really becomes an issue while uh, picking up the top, top talent going forward? No, I think you... Um... Uh, you need to be more conscious about it when you recruit. 
you know, what I, uh, what we haven't spoken about uh, here is, is kind of the concept of uh, post-traumatic growth, which I really believe in. I really believe people who have been through uh, some shitty times are coping much better with adversity generally. And, um, you know, I think we completely underestimate the power which is in the first and second generation, uh, uh, you know, immigrants and people who come to the country who've been, many of them have been through really tough times. I mean, we deliberately try to, to find them and, uh, and integrate them uh, into the fund. Uh, I think we need to be more conscious about, uh, you know, different social layers and strata and where we, where we get the people from. Um, you know, a bit of uh, people with a bit of troubled background, it uh, can be good. I mean, you know, a bit of a revenge of the nerd, a bit of uh, things that you have overcome in life. It's the main driver. Now, before we open it up for the, for the, for the audience, a final question from my, my end. Uh, Finland and Norway, we share a lot of similarities. We share the, at large the Scandinavian values. Our societies, had, in, in a big picture, are fairly similar. Um, however, you have the benefit of NATO. Yeah. Uh, you are extremely rich. How come is it that when we are measuring globally the happiest countries in the world, Finland always comes as a number one and Norway only as a good runner-up? <laughs> you know why? Because you can't buy happiness. It's about something else. It's about um, human relationships. It's about uh, closeness to nature. It's about uh, equality, and it's about trust. Very good on those words. It's very good to stop that. Uh, Nikolai, thank you very, very much. <laughs>